Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of Wellness Wednesday Inspiration. My name is Fernanda. I'm here with Dr. Linda Marquez, and we have an amazing guest today that I am sure you all are going to love. And today's theme is actually, and I, I feel like I say this every single week, but really it, it influences and it affects every single one of us. And it's how to be healthy in an unhealthy world. So how to remain healthy despite what everybody else, community, what society is doing around you, what anybody else's decisions are literally around you. How can you remain healthy despite anything, anything in your in the world? And so with that, Dr. Linda, how are you doing today? Great. Happy Wednesday. <laughs> Midday of the week already going by so fast. But I am doing well and I'm so glad you're right. Uh, you mentioned it's like every week we say, you know, this is really important and we're really excited. But the beauty of it is because we get to share so much amazing information and bring amazing guests on the show. So I'm excited to kind of get the story behind the story with Pilar. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But all yeah. is well and in your world, everything is going well. <clears throat> Oh, everything's going great. Uh, a lot of work. There is a lot of things happening right now, exciting things happening. So I am learning every day. I'm moving every day in different ways, stretching myself in many, many different ways. So that's always a positive. And yeah, I just enjoying the ride. Yeah, <laughs> it's called, they're called growing pains, right? And you know, we're going to, we're going to continue to go through them, I think the rest of our life, because what we and it's when we learn to be uncomfortable, to get comfortable in the uncomfortable, right? That's right. <laughs> when, we, when we master that. But, well, I think we should bring on our guest and a little bit about Pilar Ger Gerasimo, I believe. So she can correct me on that. She is an award-winning health journalist, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Huffington Post. And she was a health editor for them. And she's also had, um, um, she's been editor for Experience Life magazine, which reaches over 3 million people every at each issue. So that's pretty exciting. So she's got some, you know, she's impacting a lot of people in this world. And she's also an author. She's got a cool book out called A Healthy, um, The Healthy Deviant, A Rule Breaker's Guide to Be healthy in an unhealthy world. And I know a lot, I think we're kind of those deviants too, right, Fernanda? <laughs> That's right. I, I consider myself a deviant for sure. Yeah, but we're good. We're in a good way and we break the rules, but in a, um, I say kind of in a politically um, correct way. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, and she's, uh, she's also on the faculty for the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, IIN. And you know what's pretty cool about her is when she's not traveling, she hangs out on an organic farm. Is that cool in Wisconsin? So I can't wait to hear the story about that. And she's got a little pet bull, um, Calvin. So I'm sure Calvin, we will probably hear some stories about Calvin as well. But I'm glad to have her on and can't you know, can't wait to just share her with the audience. All right, let's bring Pilar on. Hi, and ladies. Hi, thank you for being Hi. with us. Super excited to have you on. Thank you. I'm so glad to be with you. And you did a pretty good job with the name, Dr. Linda. The, <laughs> well, I, I thought with Pilar, if I'm talking to a Fernanda and a Linda Marquez, probably the Castaneda Marquez family is going to get the Pilar part. <laughs> the last name is a Greek name, and it's uh -huh. really tricky. It's Gerasimo here in the United States. But in Greece, it's Gerasimos. So uh -huh. it doesn't really matter how you say the last name because you can always say, I'm just choosing the Greek pronunciation or something like there that. Jerusalem is how I see it, though. So. Thank you. And I feel that. so happy to be among fellow healthy deviants. I know that that's always a nice thing to be among friends who already get it. And I know that every week um, you guys talk about stuff that probably is mostly healthy deviant themes, as I'm guessing, you know, how to be a healthy person in an unhealthy world 101. Yeah. Basically, yeah. basically. So Pilar, I'm curious, how, how did you get into this arena and how mm -hmm. did the idea of becoming healthy in an unhealthy world and the healthy deviant came to your mind? Yeah, well, I mean, my story is part professional, part personal. And like most people 
who end up in any kind of the element of the healing arts. I have my own personal healing journey, of course, but I call mine sort of a riches to rags to riches story that I started out really healthy and pretty happy as a kid. And I lost my health and fitness and my sense of well being as I tried to fit in and comply with what other people expected of me and what other normal people were doing. And then I really had to figure out how to reclaim my health and happiness um, through a variety of different means, including nutrition and movement and sleep and stress management, also working with integrative practitioners and functional medicine practitioners who really understood, I think, the basic roots of wellness as opposed to just treating illnesses and symptoms. Um, but I became pretty obsessed with the art of being healthy in an unhealthy world during the course of my health journalism. My career as a health journalist started in 2001 when I launched uh, the magazine you mentioned, Experience Life, in partnership with Lifetime Fitness. And I, I started really understanding that the vast majority of what was out there in the health and fitness media was just not the best information. And a lot of it wasn't really addressing the socio-cultural, societal, community level issues that most of us are facing every day. So, you know, it's one thing to tell people to go eat more vegetables or, you know, tell them to like, work out in a certain way. It's another to help them overcome the challenges that they're likely to face when they attempt to do that in the context of real life. So that's really what my passion has been ever since. And some of the work I did launching a place, a, a website called revolutionaryact.com that has 101 revolutionary ways to be healthy, um, embodied a lot of my ideas and a manifesto that I wrote about thriving in a mixed up world. But ultimately it's the book, this book, the book that I spent five years writing that has kind of been the um, culmination of you know, what I think it takes uh, in mind and in body and in spirit to be a healthy person in our unhealthy world today. So we can call you an overachiever, so to speak, like you're oh. a good company. <laughs> Thank you. I bet I am. <laughs> and you know, just also with the with the focus of you know, yeah. health and and like you were saying, um, you know, in, in the journalist in you know, type of field that you were in, um, you know, it's really difficult sometimes to get to the truth of things and also mm -hmm. um, people's definition of health. Yeah. When and as you explore that, and even to this day, when people will post something on like their social media. It's like, oh, I had a um, avocado sandwich. And then if a person's gluten intolerant, it's like, okay, yeah, you know, avocado sandwich on, you know, whole wheat bread really isn't the definition of health. So, you know, kind of tying into all that, I know you've probably explored so many different pathways, you know, how do you define what, what is healthy and what isn't? You know, or is it something that's like, what's healthy for me may not be healthy for you and vice versa. Is that kind of like where yes. the roads have led you to? Absolutely. I mean, I think that notion that what's healthy for me might not be healthy for you is embedded, you know, and at, at IIN at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, that was the focus they called bio-individuality. And mm -hmm. I first learned about those concepts. Well, personally, I discovered it because I have a gluten um, intolerance myself. I actually have a celiac gene that I didn't know I had most of my life. And so when I was trying to follow conventional health and fitness media suggestions. A lot of them were about eating more whole grains. And a lot of the diets were like, start the day with two pieces of toast and cottage cheese and you know all these diet foods that were actually making me quite ill. I'm not sure that I would recommend that strategy for anybody personally, <laughs> but um, what I found was that I had to experiment and explore a lot to figure out what worked for my body mm -hmm. and also what worked for my body at different times because what worked for me in my 20s worked differently than my 30s and 40s and now in my 50s. I just have a different set of needs and priorities and desires both in terms of my life, like when I need energy for what. Um, but I think too, a lot of times people make the mistake of trying to follow one thing their whole life and then they have a health crisis the diet that was working for them is no longer the ideal diet, or they get pregnant, or they get, you know, some other issue happens. So I think it's really important to accept that you have to uh, follow some basic principles. For example, I think eating mostly whole foods, natural foods in their natural form most of the time is a really good strategy. But I also think it's really important that if people go into this very purest, sort of obsessively clean or orthorexic way of eating, and they're making themselves stressed out and miserable and giving themselves disordered tendencies around that. That's not the healthiest way to eat either. So 
my basic philosophy is pretty moderate, but it's based in whole food nutrition. And you know, most of the other common sense stuff we've learned we need as human beings to stay healthy and happy for the long haul. How do you think, Pilar, how do you think that society as a whole is influencing health when it comes to mindset, when it comes to how we live our day to day? Not, not just about our quote unquote, our health decisions, you know, our food decisions or exercise decisions, but our day to day, how do you think that's influencing our health? Well, I think what we see statistically is that right now, the vast majority of US adults are struggling mightily with their mental and emotional health and fitness that and I don't think that's because the vast majority of US adults are in any way lacking. I think it's because we live in a society that is very disruptive to people's most basic patterns and to their perspectives and attitudes. It's really hard, I think, right now to maintain a kind of perennially positive, low stress lifestyle because everything we deal with on a daily basis is this unrelenting streams of potential stresses and triggers and conflicts. So I think it really takes a special skill set to manage running up against all those challenges and not begin to feel that you're breaking down, that you can't keep up with the pace of life. You can't keep up with the expectations materially or socially of how you're supposed to look and what you're supposed to have. I know for me personally, even though I didn't have any you know, diagnosable mental or emotional disorders, uh, in my early 30s, I got so stressed out by trying to do all of the things I thought I had to do right to be a right person. I got very frustrated and stomped my foot one day on a wooden floor and broke the bone in my own foot. And that is not a mentally healthy thing to do. But I want to be clear that most of us, I think, are breaking ourselves down in ways that we don't even recognize until we get to a crisis point like that. And we really have to stop and evaluate. How am I living? What are my priorities? Do I want to keep going this way? Can I keep going this way? So I think it's a healthy thing right now that our culture is beginning to pay more attention to how our mindsets and thinking patterns and skill sets of daily life influence our health and fitness beyond just diet and exercise. How do those cascades of chemicals, cortisol and adrenaline um, affect us at an inflammatory level and at a spiritual level? Because I think that increasingly the statistics, the data in research are showing how important having a meaningful socially supported life is just to our basic day-to-day -day wellness and survival. Even if you're eating well, even if you're exercising, even if you're sleeping okay, if you are not surrounded by some good emotional and social and psychological support, the chances are you're probably gonna end up in an inflamed body as a result of that stress. So how would you describe, you know, in your journalistic um, you know, point of view, what what is healthy to you like in a nutshell yeah. so you're talking like mm. the mind the body the spirit and of course yeah. all uh, the three of them there's subsets of those so can you kind of hit a little oh, bit absolutely. on that or kind of what you've learned yeah. from you know all the research you've been doing sure well i'll say in, you know in the book um the healthy deviant i made a really <laughs> strategic decision to focus on the things that I thought most people would tend to overlook. And we'll have a long list of tendencies that healthy deviants tend to pursue in the way of diet and exercise and that. I really focus on reclaiming our daily rhythms. And I, I offer a few different renegade rituals, I call them. I'll share one with you called ultradian rhythm breaks that most people don't know about. But respecting that the human body and mind really have a fluctuating set of rhythms that they want to be in. And if you fight with those, you will end up losing every single time. I think most people don't really understand that their body is designed to have peaks and troughs of energy and peaks and troughs of focus and peaks and troughs of capacity. And that that's designed into our bodies or programmed in or basically evolved into our bodies as a way of empowering our bodies to do some of the things that they do naturally without our having to put any attention or focus on it. For example, all the autonomous nervous system things like you know blinking your eyes and heartbeats and digestion, those things happen without our having to do a lot as long as we give our bodies a chance to do them. But in our culture, we end up in this go, 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 go mode that's highly stressful and inflammatory. So one of the things I really suggest people do is begin to understand that when 
oftentimes people's practitioners will say, it would be good for you to take more regular breaks, or it would be good for you to have more rest periods in your day. What they don't explain to them is what happens during those rest periods that is so essential to our detoxification, our immunity, our digestion. I mean, every aspect of our mental and physical well-being. So I'll explain it this way. Think about it like how you get up in the morning and you start to do the thing you're going to do that day. Let's say you start at nine o'clock. And have you noticed that by about 1030, you start to kind of lose your edge. You start to feel a little tired or you start to have your focus erodes or you might feel a little distracted or grumpy or hungry or peevish. All of these signals are stress signals that are trying to get your body to slow down and take a break, switch gears, do something else. And when you take the break, what happens is that your body goes into high gear doing some really important things like rebalancing hormones and blood sugar, detoxifying your system, managing all of the little snippets of information that have entered your brain that have nowhere to go. And when you take the break, all of this rebalancing and repair and regeneration happens without you even being aware of it. And then you go back to what you were doing and guess what? You come right back up and have another nice peak if you take the break. If you don't take the break, you don't get that nice peak. And instead you start to build up all of the byproducts of your productivity, basically the pollution that is produced by the result of you just doing your thing, metabolic waste, cellular debris, neurosynaptic chaos. So what I have found is that this one skill, ultradian rhythm breaks, ultra, meaning many times during the course of the day, ultradian, is something almost nobody knows anything about, but it's one of the most fundamental mechanical things your body needs in order to stay healthy and happy for the long haul. Not a skill we're taught in school. Most, most doctors don't know about it, but I have, I have encouraged people to give this strategy a try, taking about a 20 minute break every hour and a half or so. The things that they come back with are so interesting. Like my cravings for sugar in the afternoon went away. My inability to sleep has diminished. I feel like I have more energy now to exercise. My moods are better and I'm not in as many fights with my partner or my coworkers. Now, how many of the things can you do that beneficially affect all of these different systems? You know, it's amazing to me, but it's just one of many, many examples of skill sets that healthy deviants tend to have and leverage that most other even health motivated people don't um, because they're not things that are advertised on TV or in the media. Like you're not gonna buy something to be able to do an ultradian break. You just have to decide you're gonna make it happen. And I think that's what makes the difference between being healthy in an unhealthy world or remaining unhealthy in an unhealthy world. It's the, the, the decision. Yeah. Making a decision that no matter what anybody says or thinks or society or the TV or the news or the media or anything, really anything, you're going to make a decision to be healthier today than you were yesterday and healthier the day, the, the, the day after that you were the day before, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, even though no one around you is doing that, that's the part that's really tough. It's like most people aren't going to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's super, super hard. And also the fact that it doesn't have to begin with a huge change in the routine. Like it's not like, oh my God, I won't be able to ever eat this again or ever, you know, do, do something that you enjoy doing again. It can start with small changes. It can start with like minimal, little tiny changes in your routine every single day. And when you do that and you feel better and you see a change, then they start kind of like building that momentum and the results start magnifying into your life. That's and exactly so, right. Yeah. But, it, but it all starts with that initial decision. Yeah. Without that decision, really nothing else follows. I think that's true. And, and I think it's really interesting. You know, we talk about it as mindset or mindfulness. And, and sometimes the lingo, I think, really alienates people because they're like, oh, that just sounds wishy-washy and airy-fairy. And I really like to keep going back to the science and helping people understand that the way that your body functions is dependent on your brain and your central nervous system sending the right signals and being in a condition that you can make conscious decisions about things like your food or your exercise. How can you possibly be expected to make good decisions when you're depleted, exhausted, overwhelmed, burned out, broken down, distracted? I mean, it's just, it's unrealistic to expect a bunch of people facing those challenges to somehow magically make healthy choices. So I really think it begins more than anything with self-compassion and acknowledging, 
right now we are living in a very challenging time. I mean, historically living in unprecedented times, everything is an experiment. No human beings have ever tried to live in the conditions that we're currently living in. And I don't just mean post pandemic. I mean, I'm talking about pretty much the 20th century is like unprecedented in terms of technological change too. So I think we have to be gentle with ourselves, but yeah, I believe reclamation of our health begins with reclamation of the sovereignty of our own minds and deciding that we are going to go forth each day with our own priorities for our, the health of us as an entity, you know, even in the midst of madness. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people maybe aren't aware, and I like to use that word a lot, awareness, because I think it all starts with an awareness. You know, you have to be aware and, you know, we're, we become so unhealthy as a result of social media, television, programming. It's just like everyone's vying for your attention, whether it's the, e you know, it's emails, whether it's texts, all of that. Yes. So you mentioned something about, you know, it's, I think it's pretty obvious that we're really not that healthy. You can just, I think <laughs> a person just really takes a good look at themselves. You know, look, some, look in the mirror, look at your eyes. You know, your eyes are always the windows of the soul. Look at your yes. body, look mm -hmm. at your energy, everything that you were talking about when you kind of just, you know, you injured your foot at that moment. It was kind of like an aha a moment for you. And I think we all can have those aha moments. So most people know that they're not healthy. What are some strategies, you know, what can we do? You have this for our approach. So I'd like for you to share that for our approach. Yeah, well, the four-hour approach is really a functional medicine approach. And I, I would say mm -hmm. my approach is integrating practices on a daily basis that are supportive of most functional medicine models. So I won't, mm -hmm. you know, the, the sort of repair, re-inoculate stuff, that's more of a functional medicine mm -hmm. uh, set of tools. But what I like to do is think about nonconformist competencies. What do you have to know how to do and how to be in order to be healthy in an unhealthy world. And I named three of them in my book. And the first one is amplified awareness. Dr. Linda, you said it very nicely and everything begins with awareness. And I think of that in the context of a world that is constantly trying to put our awareness on everything but ourselves. Like it's the TV and the screens and the alarms and the traffic and the demands of all of our schedules. So reclaiming that awareness and raising it higher than the average person has it is one thing. Can you be aware of what your reactions to situations and foods and energies are? Can you notice what's triggering you to make crazy decisions and begin adjusting those patterns? So awareness is one. And then the second one, which is really important, is preemptive repair. And that's really a lot of the R's that go into functional medicine are actually, unfortunately, after the problem has shown up. And I really want to emphasize getting ahead of the damage that's done to us just by virtue of living in this unhealthy society. This is a pro-inflammatory society. And if you go along with the crazy that passes for normal, you're going to end up inflamed and sick and exhausted. So preemptive repair is the art of getting rest before you're exhausted, getting good food in your system before you're ravenous for junk food, getting hydration and water in before you get dehydrated and can't think straight and just start going for alcohol. You know, simple things like that, including, you know, meditating or having quiet moments. I recommend taking the first three minutes of every day before you get into media, before you get in into the electronics, just to check in with yourself and to come to waking gradually and decide how you want to show up in your life that day. That's a really good form of preemptive repair, as are those ultradian rhythm breaks I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. So then the third nonconformist competency is continuous growth and learning. And that's kind of like what we're doing today, right? Like mm -hmm. all these different resources that we can plug into and learn from. But I think we have to accept that the skills that are required for us to be healthy in this world, they're not skills you can learn all at once. They change too over time. Like I said, like the world is changing, our lives are changing. So I really like to think about beginner's mind and enjoying the art of mastering these skills and these nonconformist competencies and building your life in a way that works for you over time, gradually, and being gentle with yourself. You can't know it all at once. And if you blame yourself for not knowing how to do everything already, you're kind of starting from a losing position. And that's no good. It sets you up for more trouble. Wow. I love that. And AR, so it's more like 
um, the awareness. Um, I like to use like acronyms like oh, AR. Yeah. ARC, so it would be Amplified arc. Awareness, yeah. well, for repair, yeah. I guess, yeah, uh, and then Continuous Growth and Learning. I know those, I actually use a lot of those um, yeah. acronyms, too, in my book, like <laughs> there's the UDR stands for the unhealthy, unhealthy Default Reality, which is my name for our society, Unhealthy Default Reality, and then uh, it's people, the ultradian rhythm breaks are URBs. I call them herbs for short, mm -hmm. but it does help to kind of give yourself little yeah. reminders and mnemonics mm -hmm. and things. Yeah. And, and I love what you said about earlier. It's like continuous growth. I'm not sure who said this, but you're, if you're not learning, you're dying. If you're not yes. growing, you're dying. And when you're learning, you're growing. Yeah. And so I, I kind of struggle with that when people are like, aren't reading any books or listening to podcasts or, you know, just, I'm like, really? It's like, <laughs> that's my passion. I was like, I have to learn something every single day, yeah. something new that I didn't know. And yeah. so, you know, thank you so much for just, you know, just really head on, um, just hitting everything just head on with, you know, bringing the awareness to people that, you know, one, I have a few takeaways, but for me, it was like you said, you know, what worked for you maybe when you were in 20s may not work now that you're in your 30s, 40s, and 50s. And I constantly say that to patients because they come in and it's the big is like, I can't lose weight. And, you know, I'm doing the same diet, but nothing's happening. And I know you've seen that in your practice too, right, Fernanda, mm -hmm. where it's just like they said they, you know, it's not working this time. Like, well, because your body's chemistry has changed right. this time. Right. <laughs> and maybe you're going through a divorce this time, or maybe you're having, um, you're moving, or maybe you're having a baby, or maybe, you know, your parents, you know, something's going on with your parents. There's so many other factors that are never taken into consideration, whereas patients will send us messages like, oh, I'm losing my hair. And I'm like, okay. And they think, is it something I'm eating or what pill do I need to take? And I'm like, what yeah. makes you think it's one of those? Maybe it's because you're not eating enough. Maybe because you have additional stress. Maybe it's the sleep. Maybe it's the mold, yeah. the toxins. Mm. There's so many, so many roads that we can go through. So I'm excited yeah. about your book and really having people, um, you know, have their eyes open, especially from your point of view, from a journalistic point of view of kind of like, this is what I, this is what I was looking for. This is what I found, but this is what maybe it means. And, you know, in different areas that people can even go and investigate further. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think finding your own path forward is another part of that very unique journey. I have a section. D and how most of us kind of pass through this, you know, descent into darkness and then come back out the other side. But we come back out with knowledge and wisdom to share. And I think that's really important, too. A big part of learning is, is also sharing with other people what you've learned so it's easier for them to go forward. Because one of the things I would just like to say, which is I think so many people have these symptoms that send them to the doctor. You know, I'm losing my hair. I have a rash. I have indigestion. I have a, in the book, I have a, what I call a weird symptom checklist. <laughs> which is like all of the signals that your body sends you in, in accordance with what I, as a indicator of what I call pissed off body syndrome, which is basically <laughs> just what happens when the body is no longer getting what it needs or is overwhelmed what you're asking of it. And each of us present with different sets of symptoms, but I think most of us are living with angry bodies or ang like sad bodies. Um, and so it's keeping a lot of doctors and nurses like you guys very busy and I think it's important we partner with really good professionals to help guide us. But I think each of us has to be aware in a way that I wasn't until I broke my body quite physically and literally, that our bodies are sending us signals all the time. And if we can just quiet our minds enough to listen and to pay attention and to honor those signals rather than fighting them or just wanting to get rid of them, I think that's a more helpful place to start. Absolutely. That's that great. is very true. And yes, talking about takeaways, I think my main takeaways are the three minutes that you mentioned in the morning. And I, this is something that I do every morning. But how are you showing up in a day? How are you, do you when you wake up, you have those few minutes to decide, are you how is your mood? How are you feeling? How are you doing? What kind of what kind of things are you starting or what kind of thoughts are you starting your morning with? And yes. then the, the taking the breaks. And I think I, I for sure can identify with, with that when I'm working and I get to the point where I know that I'm not focused enough or I know that 
you know, I just got to get up and, and move around because I'm not really doing anything. I'm staring at the computer without making any progress. <laughs> and so I literally walk around and I go to the garden or I go and do something else. Right. Yeah. Come back. And when you come back, you come back more, more focused and you're more productive than just rather literally sitting there and just staring at the computer without making any progress at all. So yeah. thank you so much, Pilar. Where can people find you? The best place to find me and most of my current work is at healthydeviant.com. And you can get a free preview of the book there. You can also take a Are You a Healthy Deviant quiz if you want to. And there's a whole bunch more free material that's available there from podcasts and articles and links to articles, um, including one in Mindful Magazine that is all about how to make your own morning ritual, that kind of morning minutes practice. So I teach classes and offer all kinds of fun experiences. But the easiest way to connect with those is through healthydeviant.com. Wonderful. And just to finalize today, Pilar, what don't you tell us something that you are super grateful for? Mm. Well, today I'm really grateful for this weird little abandoned farmhouse that I'm uh, broadcasting from. I had an internet problem in my office and I rushed up the hill to see if there was available cellular connection here in the middle of nowhere. And surprise, it was. So I'm really grateful that I was able to be here today in part thanks to that lucky set of circumstances. Good, good. Dr. Yeah. Lina, what are, you, what are you grateful for today? Oh, so much, but you know, I'm actually um, been visiting family. So, so grateful for my family. I still have both my parents, you know, alive and well. So, you know, every time I can spend with them, um, I just, I just full of gratitude because, um, you know, the people that you love the most, sometimes you don't tell them how much you love them until they're gone. And so just it's been more of an awareness for me <laughs> that, um, yeah, just super grounded, just super grateful for my family. And you, Fernanda, what are you grateful for today? Mm. I am grateful for actually the summit that we did over the weekend that gave me the opportunity to connect with Pilar, hear her story and find out more about the healthy deviant movement and and led to me talking to Dr. Linda about, hey, we, we should bring this person into the podcast. She's amazing. She has such great content and energy. And I really love the everything that you had to say last weekend and as well as everything that you said today. So I want to thank you for being that voice of health in, in the world, right? We need more people that are willing to raise their voices and, and really go out there and say, there is a different way to live. There is different. There is a way to make different choices. You don't have to live by default. You can That's create reality. You can be the, the creator and the driver of your health. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be among fellow revolutionaries and healthy deviants. And it was great fun to be with you today. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you thank so you. much, Pilar. All right. We'll and see for everyone. all the audience, thank you. We'll see you next <laughs> yes. week. All right. Bye. Bye.